right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Carbon Reduction, Rethinking the Value Chain. I'm Peter Zemsky, a strategy professor and deputy dean at INSEAD. I'll be facilitating our discussion, which is really taking us to the heart of the topic. How do we take, hopefully, many people in this audience that are responsible for big supply chains, how are we going to get the carbon out? Um, it is obviously a, a challenging topic. The great thing about this session is we have a whole diverse set of views. Um, from industry, we're going to hear from telecommunications, from pharma, we're going to hear from government, from advisory, and from tech. Um, and the real commitment here is to try and focus on like actionable insights, right? This is not about a call to action. This is about actually what actions we're looking to take. Our first speaker coming to us all the way from Asia and Singapore is Maya Hari, CEO of the green tech player Terrascope. Um, brings a deep background in tech, seven years. She was a VP of global strategy and operations for Twitter, for example. Serves on many boards out in Asia. And she will talk to us about Terrascope. Come on, Maya. Afternoon, everyone. What a privilege to be here. Um, I have to say, it's also very nice to follow Peter Zemsky. I went to INSEAD and I had the opportunity to be in Fontainebleau a few years ago, and it was an amazing experience. So it's very nice to kind of have that INSEAD connect back. Um, today, what we're going to talk about is, uh, is the messy world of decarbonization. Messy, imperfect world of decarbonization. Why do I say that? The fact that we're all here in this event and have been thinking about this topic of decarbonization, it's very clear that the world is going through probably the largest problem that we've had to solve as a humanity together, right? And thinking about the fact that the solution for decarbonizing the world involves a lot of different players and a lot of different actors who have to seemingly make the right decisions at the right time in synchronicity to get to a better outcome to reverse climate change. Right? So it's a tough problem. It's hard, but not, um, it's, it's not impossible. So possible, certainly, but hard. Also very messy and requires us in some ways to accept the, um, uh, the imperfections of this journey in ways that maybe we haven't thought about before. So that's what we're going to sp spend the next 18 minutes talking about, the messy, imperfect world of decarbonization. OK, with me so far? So, uh, a little bit of introduction about me. I'm Maya Hari. I'm the CEO for Terrascope. Terrascope is an end-to-end -end decarbonization SaaS platform. We're very focused on using machine learning and data science to be able to transform the decarbonization journey, especially as large companies need to go through this. But it's not the only hat I wear. I'm a technologist. I've been in technology for 23 years. And aside from that, I'm an angel investor. I'm a board director. Um, I'm an urban farmer in my personal life, and I'm most importantly a mother. And I have to tell you, and maybe some of you will share this type of experience with me, my two kids look at me and feel a deep sense of insecurity on what the life will be for them when they're my age, what I, what I am today. And that, to me, has been a big driver for a lot of people, a lot of executives around the world, to really feel the need to work in this space as well. So I think that's always a nice, the human reason is a very nice grounding for us to keep in mind. Let me frame the problem of messy, imperfect world of decarbonization. The protagonist in our climate change story is carbon dioxide, this seemingly innocuous, um, invisible gas that seems to have the entire planet hanging in a state of anxiety as to whether we will have enough years of stability and, and climate that we can actually operate in. So in a way, the protagonist also seems like the villain, maybe, in our story. Um, but you also see that carbon dioxide and carbon is fundamental to a lot of our life forms on Earth. It's part of nature, it's part of oceans, it's part of minerals, it's part of our food, in a way. So is it really the villain in the story? I would like to reframe the problem that we're tackling as the carbon budget being the real challenge. And I'll, I'll explain in a minute why. 
we think about the budget that we have as a, as a world, you know, experts in IPCC uh, that we all follow uh, have quantified the budget that we have left to about 420 billion tons of carbon dioxide before we hit the 1.5 degree um, ceiling, we, beyond which we'll have you know, pretty adverse effects to our climate. Today, at the rate at which we're emitting, we have less than seven years to make an impact in order to hold against going into very dangerous territories. The good news, because I am an optimist, and you can't survive being in a climate tech world if you're not an optimist, by the way. Uh, it's very frustrating. Um, but as an optimist, you see that the scientists actually say that if we're all able to take the biggest industries that are polluting today and invest in decarbonization solutions that are rapid, measurable, and moving the needle forward, even though seven years, the next decade, we'll be able to do enough, right? It requires all of us to work together. The good news is the single biggest leverage is from companies. We're well organized, right? Industries, governments, we're organized in such a way that we know how to work with incentives and disincentives. So that's the optimistic piece of this problem. But when you talk to executives who have to go down this journey of decarbonization, there is a bit of fear, there's a bit of paralysis to say, I don't know, I have committed to saying that I will get to net zero by 2050, but am I doing the right things? Are we moving forward or are we moving backwards? There is a fair amount of uncertainty. The reason I think why this happens is because the journey to net zero is actually an amalgamation of two journeys. A journey which is a data journey, when you actually get down to what is the, what is the path to decarbonization, you take the emissions of a company, you look at all the data inside the company and you put that together to form a comprehensive view of what direct and indirect emissions look like. And unless you do well in improving the data journey, you're not able to actually make a difference in the emissions reduction journey, which is the second part of this. So you kind of need to move both of those forward. And talk about messy and imperfect, whether you, know, you represent a company that's new to the climate decarbonization journey or you are well advanced into this journey, the angst tends to be in the data part of it. I don't know if I have perfect data. I don't know if I'm missing some data. What are the data gaps? I don't know what I don't know, right? And honestly, waiting for perfect data is a fool's errand. So how do we make progress in this journey accepting the imperfect, accepting the messiness, and still making material progress? There are three areas where I think the messiness exists today. One is the data, which we talked about. Very often at Terrascope, when we uh, profile um, a, a customer's data, this is where my team will get applause from customers. And it's so, it's so unexpected sometimes. It's when you tell people, this is the data, this is what you're missing, this is what's material to decarbonization, but you're missing, this is where we get the applause sometimes, which is so surprising. The second part is the supply chains. As we all know, supply chains are very fragmented. There are many, many suppliers around the world. You need to start knowing how to make a difference with the select set of suppliers that are really material to your business. You may not have the bargaining power to touch every supplier and be able to get the same information profile from each of them, but you need to know where to focus the attention. And the third piece is really targets in action. Even if a company has set a target at the topmost levels, is the whole organization aligned to what it needs to do in order to get there? And how do you sequence action? The sequencing and focus and priority is actually a very big part of the solution here. So very often, if you take the imperfection in these areas, people say, so what do you do? And my answer generally is bring data and technology into the mix. And this, this, the power of data science has proven very often to be able to help in this scenario. So I want to give you an analogy. Solving the decarbonization puzzle, in my mind, is closest and akin to solving a Rubik's Cube challenge. How many Cubas in the audience? OK, I got one hand. Thank you so much. I am not an advanced Cuber. I am a wannabe Cuber. OK, I watch a lot of documentaries about people who do this really well. But if you pick up a um, Rubik's Cube, there are two ways you could solve it. You could try it like me, slightly ineffective, but like throw yourself into it, you know, try different moves, hope that it'll turn into a good outcome, get frustrated after a few minutes, toss it away, get distracted. 
Or you could do it like the Cubas do, which is actually not knowing whether they will end with a cube that is perfectly colored, so not knowing if they get the perfect outcome. They actually tackle the cube layer by layer by layer. And so starting with the first layer, making progress, going to the second layer. And why I like this analogy for us is we don't exactly know what that path to decarbonization entirely along the way looks like. But we know enough to make material decisions for the first layer, and we can use data science and modeling to actually point us to the how to solve that first layer, and then kind of progress from there. So that's my fun analogy, by the way. This is how I lighten the mood with a tough decarbonization talk. But let me tell you a little bit about what we're seeing at Terrascope. It's been an amazing journey uh, in helping companies uh, decarbonize. So we're an end-to-end -end decarbonization platform. What does that mean to start with? We uh, focus on measurement of carbon footprint, including scope three for supply chains, which is something we uh, spend a lot of time on. But then, much more importantly, we focus on using data science and modeling to build a very ground-up decarbonization pathway that's very specific to the operations of a company, to their supply chain, and all of that. So if you think about uh, what we have seen over the past year is that companies are now using this type of modeling to look at future-forward predictive analytics. So not just to model their decarbonization journey based on what is in their supply chain today, but to actually decide every future decision I make, how do I have a carbon consideration to that decision? So not different from thinking about carbon budget for the world, we're seeing companies really be inspiring in thinking about carbon budget at a very operational level. I'll give you examples of three companies that I have personally been very inspired by in our work together. The first is Poca. Poca is a global uh, beverage brand, and um, they both manufacture beverages, but they also distribute beverages. And when, when in their journey of exploring their indirect emissions and direct emissions, they found that a big part of their carbon emissions was coming from the distributed part of their, um, of their sorry, my slides are slipping a little bit. Give me a second. Um, but a big part of their supply chain uh, con uh, carbon contribution came from a high-selling beverage that was actually something they were distributing. So they were able to actually use the platform and, and data science to map out 82% of the carbon footprint actually came from the packaging, and only 18% came from the drink itself. And there was a surprising part of the packaging, which was the shrink wrap of the plastic around the packaging, which was the biggest contributor to these emissions. Now, we got to this type of modeling with 92% accuracy without touching any supplier data. So is that perfect? 92 is not perfect. 100 would be perfect. But 92 is good enough to be very specific about what this company needs to do to decarbonize uh, their emissions. Okay? So it's a great example of turning imperfect into a great action plan. Another company that has really inspired us has been a company called Tectis. They're a Swiss conglomerate in the area of construction design, construction technology, with a large focus on being able to do things that are, um, are good for the environment and reduce embodied carbon. If you know the, uh, the construction industry and the built environment, it's one of the hardest to decarbonize. Um, and they, one of the things that they've done is actually looked at alternative technologies and tried to see which one, if they invested in and, and executed on, would be better for carbon footprint. And so we tested two things together. We tested modular construction. So do you know how you build a different modular pieces and put a, put a building together in simplistic terms? So if you took the same modular construction and built it with steel versus concrete, what would the outcome look like? And through the power of data science and the platform, we were able to actually immediately pinpoint that if you use steel in the same design, you'd actually have 20% less embodied carbon, which is a great starting point. And if you sourced the steel from a location that was renewable energy positive, better renewable energy mix in the manufacturing, you could actually bring it down to minus 30%. The other technology that we tested for them was um, thinking about something called as post-tensioning, you know, the concrete slabs that go into building uh, a building. Uh, a post-tensioning is a technology that 
uh, is used in that scenario, and post-tensioning would already bring down embodied carbon by multiple tens of percent. And if you throw recycled materials in building that slab in the post-tensioning, you'd actually bring it down by 70%. Phenomenal roadmap, if you will, on where to go and invest in thinking about design and thinking about construction technology as they move forward. The last story I'll leave you with is uh, Mitsubishi's Agri uh, Alliance, which is a company that is an importer and distributor of raw commodities, if you will, agri-commodities. So the scenario in their world is that they actually source from location A, a commodity, and they actually take it to location B and distribute it there, but they also process it in location B. As they did uh, a, a deeper view on their emissions in their supply chain, they were actually able to assess with, um, with the Terrascope platform that you could create a slightly different routing and a slightly different processing location. So you could take the ingredient from A, you could take it to an intermediate location, process there, it's also a shipping port, and then take it to your ultimate destination. Just by changing the routing of the supply chain and the processing location, they would actually reduce emissions in that supply chain by 25%. So, and, and the interesting part in this one was that not only will they have a carbon benefit, incidentally, they would also have a financial cost reduction. Not always does the financial budget and carbon budget point you in the same way, in the same direction. But when it does, it's, it's uh, honestly uh, magic in sometimes. And so these are examples that have really been inspiring to see how people are using data and analytics and predictive analytics before making a decision. And, and the power of that is immense. You have much better predictability on what the outcomes will be. You know what the carbon impact's gonna be. And you know, essentially, you do a financial budgeting exercise very often, but now you have the ability to, to also think about carbon budget, but in a way that is very specific to your supply chain, in a way that's very specific to, to your business. And so the parting thoughts I want to leave you with is that we are on a multi-decade journey to decarbonization. We do have some milestones we have to really think about and be obsessed with over the next few years. But none of this will come if we stay paralyzed because we don't have perfect data yet or we don't have the perfect scenario, the perfect tools. So embracing imperfection is part and parcel of going down this journey of decarbonization. I think very quick add-on to that is that you have to know what is material to your business versus not. And if you know what's material, that's where you double down and that's where you aim for uh, improvements. Um, with that, I think you can unlock decarbonization success. I say that a little bit tongue in cheek because success is actually not success yet. It just means that we make progress because we will know if we're successful when we get to 2050 and we're all comfortable and can live, exist without changing our clothing and our weather patterns and our homes significantly. I think it takes a village to go down this journey. None of us can actually do it alone. We need the learnings and the inspiration and the stories from each other. We need the tools that each other creates. We need to maybe even collaborate to talk to the common suppliers that we have. So it's, it's thinking about very different world order of how we do business in order to get to this problem. But um, I think we can do it as a group, as a, as a room here. I invite you to be a part of the village. I, I ask you to include us in your village, and let's make the next decade count. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maya. Do you want to really underline what she said about accepting the messiness and imperfection of the data structures? As you may know, out there, corporates are spending billions and billions on their data strategy with super mixed results. And one of the issues is they go for perfection, they never get there, and what they lose sight of and what like, best practice in data strategies is, is having particular projects that you focus on and you get things done. So one thing I like about what you're doing at Terrascope is in fact, as companies, as you build your data strategy, shooting at the tar carbon target will not only help, I think that was your key first slide, 
in the decarbonization, but it's actually going to help accelerate and focus your data strategy. So thank you, Maya, for kicking us off. Um, next up, we have our illustrious panel discussion. So I'm going to invite to join me on stage Bruno um, Brunel, Secretary General pour l'Investissement France 2030, uh, Mathieu Walik Petit, Partner and Head of Clients and Markets at KPMG, and Thibaut Desamarais, President, GSK France. Come on down. So let's start with company actions, and then we'll, we'll bring the government perspective in in, in in the middle. Maybe GSK first. So what is your carbon footprint? Um, what are the, the key drivers, the, the plastic wrapping or whatever in your case? And, and what is the ambition at GSK? Thanks, thanks a lot, Peter, and good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Thibaut Desmarais, um, in, oh. in French, sorry. Oh, Desmarais, c'est bien ça. So, um, so just you know, before answering to your question, Peter, let me give a few words about GSK because I'm not so sure that everybody knows GSK. Mm -hmm. So it's a global biopharma. We are investing in research. We are investing in clinical development, manufacturing, but also commercialization of drugs, but also vaccines. I don't, I don't know if you're aware, but four children out of 10 in the world are vaccinated by a GSK product. So we have a very, very important you know, mission. So now if you look at GSK in France, because we are in France today, I'm French, I cannot hide it. Um, we have three production sites. So it's the only European country with three production sites at GSK. And about 3,500 people working for GSK. And we strongly believe that a healthy planet and healthy people are strongly connected. So if you want to get ahead of disease, you do not need only to develop drugs. You need also to work on climate. You need to work also on nature. And this is what we are not doing, knowing that the uh, SHIFT project, that you, you know well, um, I've said that in France, the healthcare system is representing about 8% of the total emission, which is not small. And the drug is about one third of it. So what we have decided, and it's a pretty, I would say, bold commitment from our CEO, is to achieve nature positive, net zero by 2045 and 2030 uh, for the entire new group uh, GSK. And we want, with our three production sites in France, to be the number one contributor you know, to this very ambitious goal. So that's in a nutshell where we are and what is GSK. Very good. Uh, we'll definitely want to come and dig into the, some of the timing, but first, um, so when you think about actions, where, where do you need to address to make, what are the key things you need to make progress so, on? So I really like you know, what Maya said, you know, I'm not really good with the Rubik's Cube, so uh, <laughs> very, very, very quickly, you know, it's going, you know, okay, boom, I'm, I'm not doing it. Um, so what we are not doing, we are doing, let's say, basically three things. Number one is a greener product. Number two is a greener industry. And the, number th the third one is invest in people. But before you know, giving a little bit more kind of uh, information, can I ask people here, is there you know, people who are taking Ventolin or knowing someone taking Ventolin? You know this is a spray, so can you please raise your hands? Wow, wow, wow. So you see? The, this uh, is the problem. The <laughs> so, and and I, I don't know if you're aware, but Ventolin represents half of the carbon footprint of GSK worldwide. So half, 50% of our carbon footprint is due to the gas and the use of this product, so production and use. So what we are not doing is we don't want to do, to do thousands of things. So we really want you to be focused on few things, but you do it well and you do it with a lot of resources. So this is what we are not doing today with GSK. So we, are, we have a site in Evreux, so it's not too far away from mm. Paris for the non-French. Um, so we are you know, investing in, um, on an R&D program to develop a new gas, which is much greener, and that can reduce by 90, 90% the impact of Votolin. So this is what I mean by greener in a product. On greener industry, we are investing, and we are investing a lot, because last week at Choose France, we have uh, announced that we are investing 400 million in France um, for the next three years with GSK, within GSK, and 240 million euro is going to our production site. Modernization, digitalization, um, and also decarbonation. So that's what we, now, we are doing, investing on our greener industry. 
third but not the least one is people. So I've got some members of my team here, so all smiling. And, um, and here, what we are not doing at GSK, it's we are investing on people by also communicating a lot internally. So we've got our ESG report that we are you know, doing, that we are mobilizing you know, the team. We've got some shifters who came to the office this week talking about you know, the impact of digital, closing your laptop, sending less email, this type of very simple things that can really impact. And we are, for example, so moving all the um, fleet car to 100% mm. electric by 2030, which is not a given in France. So this is what you know, we are doing you know, in a nutshell you know, at Very nice. for the time being. All right, we're definitely gonna hear from the French government soon, but first uh, maybe Mathieu from KPMG, you're looking at uh, many different co companies. Is this representative? What kind of trends are you seeing with your client interests, engagements on this? Um, and, and again, what about effective actions that, that you see people taking? Yeah, actually, we, we, we do see a very strong momentum. Uh, just to give you um, two numbers, is that we, we did have a very strong activity. We triple uh, over the past two years, and we expect our activity to further triple for the next three years. So it's a very large momentum. It's in every discussion with our clients, actually. Um, First, we, we, we discussed about the pressure, the pressure coming from the regulation, the pressure coming from the clients or the consumers, but also the pressure coming from shareholders and other stakeholders. So we do feel with our clients this very strong pressure. That's behind a very, very uh, high momentum. Uh, the, the way we assist our clients is, 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 uh, is really pragmatic. The starting point is very much to set a high ambition to reduce the carbon footprint for the supply chain. And obviously, you need behind that to build a, a relevant strategy, a roadmap, and then you need to have a strong assessment. Uh, during the keynote, it was mentioned about, um, uh, about the quality of the data, and that's really, really a key, uh, a key concern, and I can really jump on it. It's, it's really important to have a reliable data to build a reliable uh, assessment. Probably two other topics that are relevant, I guess, is, is collaboration. And I guess you, you, you've mentioned that already. It's fundamental to have a collaboration between all the stakeholders. And probably a last example of concrete action is about um, investing. Investing, for instance, in energy. And I would like just to stress about what we are doing for our clients, building end-to-end -end solutions to help them in reducing their carbon footprint by, by proposing some alternative sourcing of energy through uh, power purchase agreements. It's a fantastic opportunity to source alternative and low carbon uh, energy, but also to secure for the long term pricing and sourcing. And we know from the recent months, and we are currently in a current crisis of energy, that is so critical. And we are seeing for the past uh, 24 months, mm. a very, very bo high boom of uh, PPA with our clients. Very nice. Um, just uh, maybe on, on the people side, um, in terms of pressure, do you find from bringing junior talent into KPMG, does, does the focus on sustainability help? Yeah, it, it, it helps a lot, and uh, uh, I can also reiterate what we have announced uh, a year ago, that we are uh, now a purpose-led company, an entreprise à mission, with the accent, oh. um, <laughs> and it's uh, it's not an answer. It's a, it's a beginning of a of a journey, and definitely it's completely aligned with expectations coming from our clients and our people. Yeah. All right. Now, Bruno. Um, clearly, as you said, it takes a partnership. Government is a key actor. What's your view on the role, the proper role of government in decarbonizing supply chains? And again, a little bit on what France is doing um, in this space. Well, as far as I'm concerned at the uh, Secretariat General pour l'Investissement, oh, as you spelled it well, right? Um, make it simple, France 2030, right? Very good. Uh, what we do, we supporting all those initiatives with the 54 billion euros that have been dedicated to uh, innovation. Innovation uh, uh, meant as a, a way to find solutions um, and, 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 and really um, take over all this pragmatic that we had described before. Um, what we do concretely, we help companies to invest 
in risky business. Like, obviously, when the company, you just mentioned greener product, greener factories, greener attitude, right? Uh, very often, the shareholders are reluctant um, to um, overinvest in meaning well. Is it really right? And if, if the global feeling is definitely around this idea that we need to work with a certain emergency, uh, we've seen that uh, uh, definitely government is helping. But we've lived this before. We are at this stage of our society, I would say even at our humanity, where we're moving from a kind of uh, ugly caterpillar uh, into a wonderful uh, uh, butterfly. What do I mean? I mean that um, we've seen that we're totally changing the way we see life. Uh, we use the overused resources on the planet, and now we have to optimize them. We uh, used to take all those externalities away from the company's responsibilities, and now we integrate them into it. Uh, we're looking for more meanings in what we're doing. And all this, if there is no uh, big effort for government mm. to help to accelerate this, will take years, and we don't have any more time. Um, and uh, that's why the government is definitely trying to uh, support all, innovative, all innovations in different fields, health, um, um, uh, materials, um, mm -hmm. uh, digital, to make it happen. Maybe, maybe uh, just a little briefer on a big issue in France, which is around decarbonization of energy supply. Um, how does that play in, and a little bit the French perspective there. So 50% of what we, uh, that, that's a commitment from the uh, National Assembly, 50% of this budget must be dedicated to decarbonization, which includes, of course, the supplies of uh, decarbonized energy. And we, we know we have debates about, uh, for instance, uh, um, the nuclear energy. And we think that we want to mix nuclear and renewable energies because we feel it's a safer way to go. Uh, once more, uh, back to this uh, Rubik's Cube analogies, with mm. one of the face of this cube for us uh, in France is nuclear energy. It's not the same situation in different countries, so we have to go through compromises. Mm. But at the end of the day, I don't know if anybody is right or wrong. I know that for sure, one of this uh, obsession of reducing carbon footprint uh, is the, the target, the common target for all government. And um, and if if we proven wrong down the road, fine, we'll 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 we'll, we'll adopt other strategies. Mm. But uh, as far as the French government is concerned, uh, we feel like this is a mix between this investment in nuclear and renewable energy that will make it at the end of the day. Very good. And then maybe, again, foc as you started to do, focusing beyond France, what's your thought on the variation in policies across countries? Is the com some of the competition we're seeing healthy, productive? Is the collaboration um, sufficient? Well, th three, three different points. First, the awareness of this uh, uh, climate change um, is at different level uh, in, in different countries. I was just before discussing on the floor with the major cosmetic companies and they've made huge effort mm. in creating uh, greener products. Uh, for instance, uh, solid shampoo, right? Uh, but effectively, the uh, fact is that in some countries, uh, the habits of people mm. are such that they don't buy solid shampoo. And, and it reduced by whatever, 70, 50, uh, 80, ask how many people 90 use solid shampoo? No. Yeah, how many of you <laughs> use this? A good example. Now's the time. You can well, because <laughs> proudly. You, and that's the reason why you come at Change Now, because you're a certain profile. But the reality is that, because I got, just got these numbers, uh, 200 million bottles of shampoos are sold in France per year, and only 1 million of those 200 are solid shampoo. Just to say that will take time. But it doesn't mean that we shouldn't try and try and try again. And that's, that's the principle of, of, of this common effort and joint effort. Uh, Thibaut, you have, Thibaut, the pharma industry has a long history of interacting with government. Um, maybe you could comment a little bit from your perspective on, on the role of government in decarbonization, but how also it, it's interacting with other government policies sometimes. Yeah, that, that's a good question because decarbonation obviously comes with massive investments. <laughs> Especially, you know, with the um, production mm. side. So, and, and this is where, you know, the, the difficult equation, or usually I, I call it, you know, the, the Caesar effect, where you've got in one hand inflation, you know, about 30% for us, huge investment, as we have just communicated, this 400 million. And then the other end, you've got pricing um, of drugs, which are, you know, regulated because it's reimbursed by the social security in France. And France has the lowest price in Europe. And at the same time, the pharma industry is one of the 
most taxable, I don't know if it's English, uh, industry. So, and the tax are going up every year and every year. So that's where you know, it's extremely complicated for us because you want, and we've got a strong will of investing and doing some decarbonation, but at the same time, like you know, food industry where you can increase your price, for example, you know, to follow the inflation, we cannot do it. So this is this difficult scissor effect that, yeah, uh, as you, uh, you're saying, which is difficult to manage. So that's why you know, we need to work with government on pricing, on taxes, getting some support also to, to decarbonate, for example, Ventolin. Mm -hmm. Ventolin is about two euros for 200 puff, which is, and, and the decarbonation of this product is hundreds and hundreds of millions mm -hmm. of euro to do it for a product which is, okay, uh, most you know, sold at the price of the, of the cost of goods. So that's where you know, the equation is difficult and we need to work together you know, as one. Yeah. I don't know, maybe I'm, uh, Matthew, do you wanna, Carl, before we go back to Bruno and put him on the spot on the, on the, the price of Ventoline, no, but uh, comments on, on like what you're seeing in terms and perspectives on the role of, of private and, and public partnership here. Yeah, I, I think that probably back on, on, on government probably to, yeah. to, to make some, some perspective. I think that we, we, we strongly believe that uh, there is a play through regulation and that regulation is a significant driver, you know, to, to make the transition and to push and to put pressure on, on companies. And we appreciate that there is a, a gap of maturity between large corporates and uh, mid-sized companies mm. and probably the you know, the, the, the difference between regulation for these two categories of, of, um, of companies is probably one of the, the reasons. So we, we strongly believe that regulation is a good, uh, very good driver to increase the maturity of, uh, of ESG within the, within the companies. But probably back to your question, um, it, it was around private enterprise and... And public, well actually even just on that, maybe just sorry, given where you sit, what's your view on sort of reporting standards and to what extent can the industry sort of get that right or do you really going to need government to be more forceful on? Yeah, and actually, if I can jump on, on, on this one, it's, it's very much to, uh, to build on this uh, regulation, which is, by the way, very complex to understand. And honestly, our clients are really anxious about the regulation, have some difficulties to navigate and our role, part of our role at KPMG is very much to cut through the complexity of this regulation. Mm -hmm. But again, we are on, on the right side of the regulation. We consider it's a, it's a positive uh, thing to move, uh, to move forward. So, so again, uh, the, the, the role is very much to, uh, to make the, re the regulation effective. And behind the regulation, it's a question of transparency. And mm. through tra transparency, it's a question of quality of data. And this is also where we are playing a, ro a key role because as auditors, uh, we put a stamp on such data. So it's a question of trust. But imagine a world uh, so sooner than later mm. where we have the full data available, accurate with the right level of trust. I think that we could do uh, much more. Yeah. Um, Bruno, I want to bring you back in, not, not to push you on, on pharmaceutical pricing, but just no, at the more a big picture, what, what you think is realistic in terms of the timing here, right? So COP26, lots of commitments, lots of enthusiasm, but now we're confronting some of the messy reality of getting there. Um, you've been elected to the National Assembly. You understand the politics of pushing up pricing. What's, what's your perspective? Well, first of all, uh, we have to uh, kill, uh, I would say, a, a public opinion that we're late because France is actually uh, on time mm. for net zero in 2050. Uh, we, we, uh, we understand the complexity of it. That's why all this data complexity is there. We understand the investment needed. And sometimes the public opinion is, uh, is late in understanding it. Because I understand people live a daily life and they would complain, well, you, you, you invest 54 billion dollars a euros in something. And what about schools? What about hospitals? What about my daily life? And then obviously comes the question of the taxes obviously, how do you finance this? And um, the, the answer is, how do you finance life and death, right? Because that's what we're talking about. We're talking about a planet which is in, in, the, in the emergency room. And in this ER room, uh, we need to take we need priorities. We need to decide what we mm. do right and wrong. So in terms of timing, I think we, we, the last thing to do when you're on an icy road is to break. <laughs> that's the last thing you want to do. 
you have to uh, uh, quite the opposite. You have to accelerate, which is not the natural instinct yeah. of someone driving, right? Except if you live in Canada or if you live in the middle of uh, the North Pole. Usually when you're on the icy road, you break. And, whoo, and then you spin and you never know when you're going. So the role of the government is first to warn you this is an icy road. Secondly, to teach you, and that's why we're spending 3 billion euros mm. with France 2030 into education mm. to add 1 million people with those new skills, yeah. uh, new processes, new structure, new uh, uh, ways to build buildings and so on. And the third responsibility of the government is to make sure that we understand that things have to be in order and, and the responsibility of the government is just to tell the truth that yes, if we, will, if we don't do this, uh, we, we will not be able to move to a situation that will get you better. So quality of life goes through those efforts, which needs from the government kind of courage to just say honestly that no, when you're in the ER room, you don't treat the patient the same way mm. than when he's just uh, in, a, in a very convenient place. And the last thing is like the best thing for Ventolin to reduce his carbon footprint is to, uh, to, to get a better hair, right? Yeah. A better quality of air, so you don't need to use it, and then mechanically, it will be better, uh, a better life for everyone. Nice, thank you, Bruno. Who do you agree? Uh, uh, very nice. Uh, let me uh, maybe pick up on, I'd be interested, the other two panelists think about your, your talk about skills that we need to build. So when you think about um, training people, raising awareness, that, that whole area of, of this transition, any thoughts on what you're seeing as key skills, capabilities, you can start. Very much um, increasing, increasing the skill of, of our talents is critical. Um, and I can, and thank you for this uh, question, I can really announce today that we have... Uh, this was not planned. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. That we, we, we have uh, built a, um, a, a leadership and, and a training program with HEC, so a, a well-known uh, business school in France, to really upskill uh, our uh, our talents in ESG. So it starts next month. So we will announce uh, it will be announced uh, tomorrow. So you have the privilege of this uh, uh, 24 hours uh, in advance. So well done. Okay. <laughs> but I obviously, uh, mm. we we have two key pillars. It is very much to to be dedicated to our clients and to assist our clients. But more than that, training our people and upskilling our people to the right expertise because it is what we deliver to our clients, it's so important. So for me, you know, it's a little bit what I've said earlier. I think you know, it's, it's extremely important. We've got a responsibility, as you know, leadership of an organization to show the way. So it's exactly what we are doing, pushing you know, our um, um, corporate office you know, to invest in France, you know, to do this greener you know, product. So this is what we are doing in France. So pitching you know, our group you know, to make mm. sure that so after you know, employees see it and say, OK, so we have you know, the will, we have the level of investment. So GSK in France is really you know, leading the way in this carbon footprint uh, reduction. So after you know, it's, it's sending a strong message to your teams mm. and employees. So, OK, if they are doing it at this level, what can I do at my level? And this is what also we are doing with the shifter, what I was saying earlier, and different, you know, a lot of activities, but small one, you know, one by one, you go really layer by layer, and everybody can, you know, have this uh, contribution. Mm. Uh, and we've got some very good uh, examples today. For example, we are doing the public private, you were uh, speaking earlier, and just was thinking that we have a big vaccine site in the north of France, and we are producing for almost 120 countries. And, and here, you know, we have done a partnership with the state, with EDF, to, install, uh, to put some heat pump. So it's kind of really kind of uh, seems to be simple. It's mm. a massive investment, mm. again. But we are reducing by 50% the um, emission. And, and we are reducing also the energy cost that we are mentioning earlier. And that's really a, a strong will. And if you do it in your factory, you mm. could do it at home also, and you just showcase, and this is the way you, know you do it. It's kind of a positive cycle. Just one brief thing from INSEAD. So over the last few years, we started building more sustainability teaching and modules, and it wasn't selling for example. You know, people would ask about it, oh, that's really nice. And in the last, I don't know, 12, 14 months, it started to sell. So we, you really start to see companies now getting more serious and building the skills. So it's a 
one encouraging sign. Um, maybe um, one last thing before we rack up. Maybe, Matthew, we need to look, obviously, for all the, the leverage points we can. And if I think about business and transforming business, one huge area of capability is private equity. I'm not sure how many private equity people we've seen around here, but they have tremendous um, business models and capabilities in transforming. Um, I guess you work with some of them. Or, or what, what's your view on are we going to see um, some of that engine linked up to green and, and decarbonization? I, I really believe that PE firms can really make a, make a change. Just, just to give you um, one number, PE firms contribute or altogether um, three trillion of dollars in terms of cash available. And if you consider the financial indebtedness, you can even double or triple this, this amount. So it's not a question of cash. The cash is here and is available for investment. And by the way, we have seen an increase of um, alternative fund dedicated to investment in ESG. But more than that, um, and I will uh, share with you a second uh, key, key number, is that 30% of mid-sized companies in France have a PE firm as a shareholder. So it's a massive opportunity for them to transform companies in that direction and to invest properly mm. to make a better uh, future and to transform that business model. Yeah. So anyway, well, for those who are with solutions, we definitely need to build bridges between people with the solutions and some of these private equity firms over the coming years. All right, it's going to wrap up. I guess um, as you look at the audience, uh, any last um, piece of advice or call to action for corporate leaders in this space, your peers? You want, you want me to go first? Yeah, you can go first. Yeah. So uh, what I'd like to say is adopt a, a triple A uh, strategy. So I mean by triple A, it's uh, assess, address and act. So it's pretty simple, uh, but the um, assessment is really understand your carbon, carbon footprint. Sometimes, as you said, Maya, it's very difficult, but let's try, let's give a try. Address, you, you know where you've got some gaps and, and, and you really understand what you, you could potentially do. So really address you know, these different matters, layers by layers. You don't want to do everything at the same time. And the last one is act. Act is like for us, in our case, we know that 50% of the carbon footprint is coming from one product. So rather than doing thousands of things, act, prioritize, and invest where you can really have an, an impact. So triple A. Very good. Mathieu, and then well, Bruno, you're going to get the last Yeah, one. happy. Um, happy to join here. Um, I think that the direction of travel is very clear. Um, th there is a, a question around accelerating the pace of, ex uh, of execution, and that's really crystallizing some value for those who can anticipate. And more than ever, you should put ESG in everything you do. All right. Bruno, closing words. Well, in the situation we're in, um, I think the most important action is to build trust. To build trust and to make people believe. And if you doubt about it, look in my back. This thing, the Eiffel Tower, uh, at that time, was just impossible to, con to, to conceive and to build. And effectively, it's here. And it's been uh, used at the ori originally just as a showcase of technologies, so something uh, fairly useless. <laughs> but now it's used as one of the main uh, transmitter of information and telecommunication of Paris. <laughs> which means that, uh, as the Japanese says, Inase Banaru, which means if there is a will, there is a way, and there's definitely a will at the government. All Thank right. You. Thank you. Big round of applause. Thank you, gentlemen. All right. So we're going to go to Orange Group and close with uh, Jean-Benoit Basset, head of corporate social responsibility at Orange Group. Oh, we'll get your music. Sir. Uh, so, I guess. So we could say this is a fireside chat, but actually we're going to say this is an Eiffel side chat. There you go. So a new, new concept in, in speaking. Um, I guess let's start at the beginning. So what is the carbon footprint that, that you have at, at Orange Group? What are your key drivers? Maybe well, some words. Yeah. About Orange first. Yes. I'm sure that everybody knows Orange, but two words, two, two figures, 25 countries. We're operating in 25 countries, mainly in Europe and Africa. Mm and 140,000 people working for Orange. 
That's the only two other we can no, consider. Right? Two, two Actually, it's going to be quite interesting because we can compare decarbonization in Europe versus Africa, which are not exactly that, that, the same thing. That's not at all the same thing. Uh, about uh, what is our carbon emissions? 7.3 million tons. The orange carbon emission is 7.3 million tons. Is this number accurate? <laughs> I don't know. Mm. We believe that on scope three, everybody knows scope one, two, and three, I'm sure here. We believe that on scope three, the margin of error is something like 10, between 10 and 20%. Mm. Is it enough for uh, if you want to do a financial budget, you cannot come to the place saying, I have an EBIT day, and I'm sure that the number is right with a margin of error of 10 to 20%. But to act on carbon, that's enough. Yeah. So how does it split? Because mm. we have three scopes, mm. mainly in scope three. Our scope one is 0 0.3 million tons. <laughs> and why do we have a scope one? Scope one, when you are burning fossil, fossil uh, fuels, because we are operating in Africa. Mm. And in Africa, the grid is not always even present or not always so good. So we had lots of diesel generators to uh, power our, our sites. Our scope two is uh, 0.9 million tons. We are operating half of the electricity we are using uh, is in France. So France, as you know, is quite a low carbon country, but we are also operating in country where it's not exactly the same case. For example, in France, for one gigawatt hours, you have 50 tons of CO2, 55 tons of CO2. In Poland, it's 600 tons. And our record, personal record at Orange, is Botswana, 1,370 tons of CO2 per gigawatt hours. Mm. So once again, you don't mm. have the same challenges in Botswana as in France. Well, and, and scope three. Scope three, then it's mm. six, six million tons mainly on what we call the upstream, which is what we are buying, in fact. Mm. And upstream represents 90%, 90% of our scope tree. And why so? Because we are processing lots of things. First, services. We had lots of people inter uh, who are maintaining the networks, what we call in our language fields operation. Fields operation and civil works, because we dig trenches to put fibers, we construct poles, etc represent roughly a third of our scope three. Then we are buying lots of equipment to put on the tower, for example, for mobile or in our data center in our sites. It represents uh, roughly a fourth of carbon emission. And then we have these things, uh, smartphones, <laughs> because we are buying and selling smartphones. So these things, for example, is something like 40, 40 kilos, 40 kilos of CO2. It counts in, in our scope three because we are buying the thing and selling the thing. And moreover, it uses power to be, to be charged. But m the main part of the CO2 emission for devices comes from the manufacturing, especially in countries like France, obviously, the same, not the same situation in Botswana, for example. <laughs> and, and so what is... And we also have boxes. Okay. So smart, smartphone and devices is roughly a, 40, it's a big 10% of our carbon emission, and boxes, the internet uh, box you have at home, is. 10% of the carbon emission counting manufacturing and usage. And so what's the, now that you've laid that out, what's the ambition and, and where are the priorities in terms of tackling this? The ambition is quite simple. We, have, we know at Orange only one figure about 2040, which is net zero carbon. I don't know what will be the EBITDA, I don't know what will be the revenue, <laughs> but I know that we will be net zero carbon, which means that we will divide by 10 our CO2 emission between the starting point was 2018 and 2040. And we will compensate the 10 remaining percentage, because when you are doing activities, you emit carbon. We will compensate it through what we call carbon pits, which are forest, but mainly mangrove. We are investing in mangrove in Cameroon or Madagascar, for example. Uh, Cameroon mangrove. Madagascar is something else. And we already have secured uh, roughly what we need for 2030 in terms of, uh, mm. of carbon pits. And I would just take but just... Yeah, go ahead. Just, it's, it's a good thing to have a, a target, a long-term target. But if you had no milestone, it's useless. Because you always say, I will do it later on. Because there is, nobody in a company has a plan for 2040. It's even hard to have a plan for 2030. So we have milestones, and we have carbon emission milestones for in 2025, and we have a carbon emission milestone in 2030. And then 2040, mm. it will be net zero. And just to dig in, how, how are things different between like the African operations, the French, some of the Europeans? So I, I give you some insight about uh, energy, for example. But if you look, if you take the numbers I give you and if you calculate rapidly, 
you realize that scope 3 represents 83% of orange emission. But that's the average. In France, scope 3 represents 93% of carbon emission. Why so? Because we have quite a decarbonized electricity and we have very, very few diesel generators for our mobile sites because they are only there when we have a switch off, which is not often. But if you look at, Africa, at Middle East and Africa, scope 3 represents only 55%. You see the, 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 the distance between France, which is half of our operation in Europe, 93% in scope 3, uh, middle, zone, uh, middle East and Africa, 55%. So definitely you don't have to do the same things in both, in, in mm. both geography. And that's a, a key point. If you want to be efficient, you have to de-average what you are doing. You have to do contextual uh, action that are pertinent for the location you are working in. For example, decarbonization of energy, I'm, I'm sorry, might not be a priority in France because we have nuclear energy. When I said because we are already have a low carbon energy. Nevertheless, we are signing PPAs in France and we'll keep on going with PPA because I perfectly uh, agree with what has been said. We don't have to oppose nuclear and renewable. We have to do both of them at the same time and at the right pace. That's the challenge. But in Poland, for example, we'll come up with 100% renewable energy because in Poland, uh, it's uh, it's more than 10 times more CO2 per, per for, for the electricity. How do you, um, again, maybe probing a little bit on, on Africa as well, I mean, you're responsible for CSR in general. Mm -hmm. So do you find um, interactions, conflicts, need to balance decarbonization and some of the social parts of your, your responsibility? Yes, maybe you have seen this morning Kate, uh, Kate, Kate Redford, the, the inventor of the donut theory. The donut theory, yes, the donut, yes, yes. And the donut theory has saved me, in fact. Because the first time I looked at uh, the environmental impact, the only solution is have is to stop business, in fact. <laughs> That's the best way, in fact. To, in order to decarbonize, you have to do two things. Decrease the volume and decarbonize the volume you are, you are buying. For energy, for goods, for everything. But then if you want to come to a minus, uh, minus 90%, then you have to stop activities. But when you look at the donut theory, you realize that because we consider at Orange that internet access is an essential uh, social mean, uh, mm. uh, need, sorry, you, you realize that you have to do this. And when you are building networks, and when you are uh, educating people to use digital technology, then you, you permit them to, to get off the center of the donut to be inside the donut. And that's why, for example, we know that we will, between now and 2025, we will increase our energy consumption in the African and Middle East zone by 25%. We will stabilize it in Europe unless we are developing networks, unless we have a huge explosion of traffic, of digital traffic, etc. We know that we have to at least stabilize and even decrease in Europe to, can, to afford to increase it in, in, in Middle East and Africa. And that's the same for scope 3. If I look at the last four years, we have decreased our scope 3 emission in Europe, but we have increased it by 30% in middle zone and Africa, and uh, middle uh, mm. eastern Africa. We call it MEA in, in, in your answer. We say MEA, you will know that MEA is Middle East and Africa. So we have increased it by, by a third, in fact. Why so? Because we are deploying networks. Um, okay, what are the, the practical challenges in, in, in sort of getting this done in your supply chain with your partners or even within Orange? That's, it's impressive to hear your command of, you know, the numbers, the footprint, but if I called in business leaders from Orange, would they have the same awareness? How's the, you know, the transformation both within and outside Orange? How, how does that go? First, we have to understand and to share a common language, and that's tough, in fact. Because as I mentioned to you, the solution is what we call the double less. Less volume, less carbon in each piece you are, you are buying. Energy, smartphone, equipment for the network, cars that are going through the countries to maintain the network, etc. So if you, come to a, you go to a marketing guy and say, hey guy, the solution is to sell 10% less smartphone in 2030 compared to today, his first reaction will not be, okay. <laughs> So oh, no. we have to educate them, and we have a plan. We will know we will sell less smartphones in 2030 than we are selling uh, today, and we are, we are selling less smartphones today than we were selling uh, four years ago, 
just because we encourage our customers to expand the life of their, of their smartphone, for example. So what we have to do is to make them understand what is at stake, in fact. Because we all know the responsibility we have, but business is also at stake. How will we be able to operate in 10 years if we cannot decarbonize our processes and our business model? Just take one example. Today, in the European market, a ton of carbon in 2024 cost 90 euros, 90 euros. Orange is 7.3 million tons of carbon. If we had to pay for, which is not the case today because digital technology is not a big emitting, so we are not submitted to this type of constraint, but if we had to pay for these externalities, as we say, then it will be something like 650 million euros. In 2030, we'll know that it will be at least 200 euros. Then it's 1.4 million billion euros. Can a company like Orange afford this? No. Will we, pay, will we pay carbon taxes, carbon credits? Certain, not sure. Most probably we won't be taxed for that. But we will buy energy, we will buy products from companies that may be taxed for that. So at the end of the day, we will have to pay for this externality we are not paying today. So if we are not able to manage this externality, we are just closing business, in fact. And another example is about the, what we call the critical minerals. We have identified six metals, which, represent, which we can find in a fourth, 25% of what we are buying. These six metals we know are in tension and will be rare metals in 2030. What happens when something is rare? It's more expensive. So if we have, if we have an increase in the price of the equipment we are buying, containing gold, for example, and you have gold in a smartphone, you have gold in a router, you have gold in a, in a mobile antenna, then it will be a challenge for us. So our message, the message we have to give to, uh, to the manager is that CSR is just not the goodies that is good at the end of the annual report to say, I have ticked the case. We say, tick the box. Yes. I have ticked the, no, it's not that. It's a question of business. That's why we said now at Orange that we should be EEG by design. That's what mm -hmm. has been said previously. EEG should be at the heart of the way you consider the business. You don't have to ask you what will be my carbon emission or what will be my energy consumption at the end of your strategic plan, but at the beginning of it. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Um, any reactions to some of the things we talked about earlier, your view on the role of government in the space or um, data, mm -hmm. some of those topics? Uh, data, data <laughs> is, is something that is quite uh, obvious for, uh, for us at Orange. Data right. is key. Uh, I, I remember the three A. The first one is assess. You need data. You don't need to have very perfect data because the seek for perfection is a nevrose, we say yep. in France. It's a ne nevrose. The, you speak French, you can translate yeah, yeah, nevrose the, in English. The, 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 uh, well, nevrosis, thank you. Yeah, 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 sorry. Oh, so okay. you, don't have to, you don't have to be perfect to act. Mm. But you have to, at least to know where, where you are. And there is a joke in France, which is a, I call the joke of, of the lighting. It's a guy is, is losing his key, and he's charging his key where there is light. Yes. He has lost his key <laughs> there, there, but there it's dark. Yeah. So there's no light, though, so he's, charging, he's, he's looking for his key under the light. And that's exactly four years ago what we were doing by Orange. We were looking the carbon reduction in energy, which is 10% of our emission. So it's very important to have this data just to know where to act. You don't have to know if it does, does, doesn't have to be accurate at 1, 5%, whatever. But at least we know that we have a problem in scope 3. We know that in MIA zone, we have a problem in energy, and we have to put solar sites. We have more than 7,000 solar sites in MEA, or roughly 20% of the sites we have in the MEA zone are powered by solar panels, for example. Mm. And we know that we have to get rid of these diesel generators. There is a country, I won't say it, where we have 98% of our mobile sites that are connected 24 hours a day to a diesel generator. Mm. If we put some solar, some solar panels here, it would be a good thing. Uh, yeah, For cost also, they, by the way. Also, mm. that's uh, security as well, perhaps. But um, what, so, you're in the middle of a, a big transition. What, uh, you seem quite motivated by this journey. What is it that keeps you oh, personally? I, I didn't answer your question oh. about government. Yeah, yeah, you didn't. You want to go? Okay. Please don't build regulatory cathedrals. Don't what? Don't build regulatory cathedrals. 
Ah, yeah, cathedral, yes. There is something you know maybe, the CSRD, okay. Customer Social Responsibility Disclosure. It's the new European reporting. Yes. It's really a nice thing. It's far better than what we had before, but the CSRD is 1,100 data points that we have to come up each year. And that's not obvious data point like the customer number, the, the, your customer number. It might be a very specific data points. So we really have to never forget that this type of reporting should help us to pilot our business to transition. And that should be for the sake of the reporting itself. So we have to make, by, to, to make first the double materiality analysis. Where do I have in, an impact on the planet and people? And then report precisely on this one. And the other one, if it's not material for us, it's too bad. Don't spend hours to report on this one. That, that, that's a message. Uh, that government, a, by the way, is also, motivating. <laughs> is also very important because we need government action, for example, to develop circular economy. Huh. When I buy today something, I don't know what is the LCA, life cycle analysis of this thing. Huh. And that's too bad. Uh, I would love to have a European directive or a French directive uh, obliging people to say when I buy a, a router, then the LCA of the router in terms of water, CO2, etc., is that. So he wants to trade the CRD for circular reporting. No, well, there we, you go. You're we, we will do CSRD and we are preparing for it. <laughs> um, and, all right. that, and that's a good thing. But I prefer anyway. to have uh, this type of regulation that other types so, of Thank you for, I think, again, what we were looking for, real concrete um, views of what you're wrestling with. Same question for you. Any final um, calls to action or advice for your peers? Advice, be operational. Be precise. It's, it's, it's fully necessary to have global objective like minus 45% between now and, 20, uh, and 2030. But you will really, really change uh, things when you dig into the processes. The people who are responsible for the carbon emission at Orange are not the people of my team. They are the operational. The people responsible for carbon in Moldavia is the CEO of Moldavia. It's not me. And the people responsible for carbon emission of network in Moldavia is the CTO, chief technical officer of Moldavia, etc. So that's the, the key message. In fact, the ones who are responsible of the CO2 emission are the ones who are managing the operation. Mm. Exactly the same thing for the cost. Very good. Thank you to all the speakers. Thank you, Jean-Paul. Thank you. Thank you.